America BC. This will be a first in a series of documentaries that we hope to make available to you concerning ancient America. And we wish to recognize Alan Deal's work of ancient America, which he did a fantastic job on much of the research that will be covered even in this program. And we thank him for that. Before Columbus discovered America, it is obvious by facts, tracks, and uh, signs left by early men that he was a late comer to the Americas. I speak other than even the American Indians. That the Iberians, that is to say the Celts, that went over the Caucasus Mountains during and after the captivity of the Assyrians, visited this great nation, America. God's destiny, his plan and his purpose for his people is well-founded. So let it be no miracle or seem strange that Iberians are Ebers or Hebrews, really, the ten tribes. We, those ten that went north over those Caucasus Mountains, later being called Celts, settling in Europe, which is, has been documented beyond any shadow of a doubt. And this documentary looks to a small company of men, a small armed, uh, no doubt, uh, company, let us say, that traveled from Spain. How do we know they're from Spain? By the tracks they left, as you will discover through this documentary. I want to go to Spain for a moment, if I may, and show you the travels that these men uh, encountered upon. We know that they left this vicinity because of one of the letters of an alphabet that was used. They crossed the Atlantic, no doubt to pass the Azores, a very short distance, then on across, probably even spotting Bermuda, and then down through the Bahamas, and no doubt exploring in here as they came on into the Gulf of Mexico, up the Rio Grande River from that Gulf of Mexico, following it a regular highway and the Rio Grande on up into the offshoot of, the, of a, this small river that runs up 30 miles south of Albuquerque and 30 miles south of Albuquerque they set up camp for a period a number of years to be exact and it is the sign they left on this mountain the fortification their headquarters they're the outlying, what we would call modern-day foxholes that are left protecting this mountain, a mountain in which there's only one way up, no doubt to protect from the natives of the land at that time. And we call it Hidden or Mystery Mountain, as the locals call the mountain in that place. The Indians calling it um, the cliff with the strange writings. And I would, uh, you can well understand why they call them strange writings as you will visually see them in a few minutes. Ancient Hebrew, pure ancient Hebrew. And yet a scribe who was not probably known as a professional scribe, but a people that truly loved our father for on that great stone at the gate entrance to this great mountain, we find the Ten Commandments of our father. Now I, I want to, show you, if I may, within these Ten Commandments, there is the letter Q in the ancient Hebrew language. Uh, many of you English-speaking people might say, well, I didn't know there was a Q in the Hebrew alphabet. Well, there is, and it has a K sound. May I pronounce it for you? Kof. Or I will over... Um, over... Um, probably correct for you, if I may use that terminology, quaff, 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 that letter. Let me show you, if I may, this was the term and the form used in the Middle East. You might say like a small flower stem, either um, here, or sometimes this circle would appear with the stem coming all the way to the top. But basically, this being the letter Q in the Hebrew alphabet, during, say 600, well, all the way back to the time of Moses. But we have a strange letter that appears on the writings, the cliff writings in New Mexico, as well as throughout Central America. 
And in the place of this standard Q, we see this letter, this letter, almost uh, resembling the Roman numeral 10. It might give you deeper scholars something to think about as to why, after the travels up through Spain, that this numeral would have been picked up to replace the Q. Now the irony is this, we know through research that the writings on the wall in Albuquerque were there uh, at least 300 years ago because of Indians and because of the family that has the land grant that uh, owns, even if you would, this great mystery mountain. That, uh, in other words, would take it back the time because we did not understand what this letter meant until the, the uh, say about 1884, 1884, because of writings by the Mound people in Central America as well as other places even in the Middle East, as this word back down to the time of Christ was used. Um, it was found uh, in um, Spain and other, uh, Spain even on down into the Middle East working its way back. That is to say from about 500 B.C to the time of Christ, the time Christ walked this earth. This letter Q. Now, what does that mean? It means this. The writings in Albuquerque could not be a forgery, for indeed if someone were going to create a forgery, they would certainly use the letter Q that is accepted, recognized, and known to be a part of the alphabet in such a simple writing as the Ten Commandments. The commandments that our Father gave to His children. This letter would have been used by any scholar that had the ability to place the Ten Commandments on that stone with the neatness and method of percussion with an awl used in New Mexico. How precious. No, quite the contrary. We find a letter for Quaff that was not even understood before the year 1884. We can place the writing and authenticate it in New Mexico long before 1884. Therefore it is genuine. It also documents the fact that the people that made this mark came from the area of Spain. They were Hebrews or Iberians and they were a part of the ten tribes of Israel. Our Father's people, as they migrate to this great nation, setting the path. I want to share something with you concerning this terrain. When you look, when you stand below and look up at Mystery Mountain, there are huge stones, perfect, uh, perfectly um, round, absolutely round, uh, almost like they had been molded in that shape. But the shape was formed because of red hot lava pouring from the ridge of the mountain when it was active in the world it was. And these huge stones rolled down the side of that mountain. Occasionally you'll see one or two that crash together and when it breaks open it's concave where they broke open as they rolled to a stop, absolutely concave, as that red hot molten lava sheared. You know, in all my travels, I've seen lava flow in many ways. But to see it flow after having picked up this snowball effect, if I may call it that, by the lava being of such a consistency, that it would gather to itself and roll into a huge ball and come crashing down the side of this mountain. I want you to picture yourself if you would. Is our Father telling us something? If you were to stand beside this mountain in the spot where the gate stands and to see the beautiful commandments of the voice of our Father, hear my voice and obey me. And you were to observe the rim of that mountain and to see the fire and the hail and the brimstone rolling down that mountain in, in um, balls of fire, some of them four and five feet in height. And yes, even the writings, uh, that huge stone that the Ten Commandments are upon, a part of that, picking up debris as it came to set a perfect 
format or a place, a slate, in place for man, then surely it would remind you of that scripture, that scripture that was given. The scripture, I shall rain down fire, hail, and brimstone in the end times. I will use it um, to destroy mine enemies. What I'm trying to say to you and convey to you is as you stand at the gate, it is very obvious, very, very obvious that our Father intended that we see a great deal more of a sign for the student of God's Word as he, see those hu as he sees or she observes those huge stones of fire. That what a picture it would have made as God's nature, God's action. Inasmuch as he spoke and nothing became everything. Informing the slate. A natural slate provided for God that one of our ancient people placed there for you to let you know that God is real. That his word, as he described, he would scatter, scatter, scatter. Certainly he did. And he accomplished a great scattering. And our people being, if you would, the wanderers and explorers that they are to discover new uh, worlds, to discover new um, uh, lands, never satisfied. I think there's a deep lying reason for that. I think it would fall back to that old saying, this world is not our home. And what it refers to is this world age. This world age is not our home. As God uh, allowed each soul to be placed into one of these flesh bodies. To traverse the plane. And as we observed um, the helicopter in the opening clip. Approaching and moving in toward that great mystery mountain. Hundreds and hundreds of years before. We pinpoint one date, September the 18th, 107 B.C. But I'm sure there were other trips made to this mountain as early as 500 B.C. We know that a group, not like unto us in this modern age with the modern convenience of helicopter, would move into that place. But a set of weary voyagers, as they explored as they came uh, up the Rio Grande, for any time you have a stream of water, that is life, for water is life, even as the living water, Jesus Christ, is eternal life. A perfect highway, exploring on foot to that mountain and going to that highest point, leaving the signs, Yahweh, our mighty one. We know they are men that loved our Father. Writing upon that stone his Ten Commandments again, knowing if they followed those commandments, they were safe, and apparently they were, for they were very wise, and what a military camp it was, with their headquarters set and protected by outlying outposts on, a, on the top of this wonderful mystery mountain. As days go by in witnessing even that eclipse, I think our Father had that eclipse happen at that time, whereby He could share it with you now to know and to see a part of America B.C., America before Christ. As we endeavor to bring again, this being number one, a series of special documents to let you know that America is blessed by God now and it has been for quite some time. <laughs> America must be blessed of God when the early travelers would pay him that respect and know that showing that love for him would touch him. As you see over that great mountain in New Mexico, that ancient sacred name, the name he truly likes to be called, that tetragamation in ancient Hebrew. Do you understand? I didn't say modern. Ancient Hebrew. Yahweh, our mighty one. All the love and the respect in the hearts of these men. And the protection and the long arm of our Father as he would guide and protect them through that travel. And we pick up the footprints and the sign. And I think even the love uh, that they left 
in this trail. Left it when? Left it in America, B.C. I thank our Father for the privilege of being allowed to participate and be one of those that had part in this documentary. I hope it brings you a blessing to know his love for this great nation, for this hemisphere, if I may say, as he scattered his children throughout uh, this earth in this earth age, and yet leaving that sign for us, a sign of the end times, for it could have only been the end times, with the fire, the hail, and the brimstone coming down. Your Father loves you dearly indeed to set these signs aside just for you. Beautiful hidden mountain. Here you see a shot looking up, probably the only practical way to climb the mountain. This volcano, picture it in your mind as huge uh, fireballs roll down. And here circled you see that great stone, the stone at the gateway, that stone with the sacred commandments written upon it. And as you make your way up the gateway path there to the top. You come to the stone that has the zodiac uh, encircled there on top where you'll hear Buzzy giving you the details of the zodiac. Now let us go to the stone. Well ladies and gentlemen here we are. We're at the place where in my mind there is no doubt whatsoever the ten tribes that went north over the Caucasus Mountains later moving into Spain. They're called the Iberians. Iberians, Hebrews, all the same thing, ancient Hebrew. Probably one of the best examples of anywhere in the Americas, especially if we think of it as some would America BC. That's to say America before Christ. Here you see living proof. Um, we know that there have been one or two professors that dated these writings approximately 1934. However, we know locally families that witnessed this back to the 1800s. I'm going to translate this for you. This being uh, Palo Ancient Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew. The Indians called it the cliff with the mysterious writings or the strange writings or mystery writings. And yet there's nothing strange about it all as it is almost perfect uh, ancient Hebrew. There are specific letters within it that let us know beyond any shadow of a doubt it is not a forgery and that it was not the tribe of Judah nor Benjamin that placed this writing here but one of the ten tribes migrating through the Gulf of Mexico up through the river, uh, Rio Grande and then into a small stream giving them abundant water even in this desert uh, land. The scribe made one short error. I will call it to your attention as we come to it. I will also point out one specific letter. We have here in stone the Ten Commandments. Let me translate it as it is. I am, and here we have the sacred name. My dear one, even in the Dead Sea Scrolls we find this sacred name written in ancient Hebrew, Yahweh. I am Yahweh, your mighty one, who has brought out you, or you out, in English, from and of the land of, and then notice we're going to skip this second line, we're going all the way here, and also there is one stone missing, with one letter missing here, and um, I brought you out of the land of, and we have Egypt. Here you can see one bare part of the letter. Out of the land of Egypt. And um, here. Mm -hmm. And then he continues on. Out of the land of Egypt um, from the house of bondage. And then you will note after the word bondage here, we have a carrot. After he had finished this inscription, he realized he had left out the first commandment. And he reinserts. We'll cover that, but let's continue on. And we'll drop back and pick up. Uh, many would say, well, this documents that it is modern. Not so. 
Not so. We know that uh, from one letter found in this, that the carrot itself, uh, originally an arrow, we would call it, pointing to a different location, was probably by, given by the ten tribes. Uh, okay? And then, after the word Egypt and the carrot, I'm just going to cover it and I'm going to let the camera skirt it. Okay, I'm going to read from this point to this point. Um, out of Egypt, not you shall take for yourself a graven image, not shall take, and we skip back to the bottom line here, not shall take you the name of um, Yahweh, and again that beautiful sacred name, not take the name of Yahweh in vain. Remember the day. The, and then uh, through on this line. And then we come back to the next line. And I'm just going to cover it for you from there on until we... Well, I want to drop back. Uh, I, I beg your pardon. I want to come back down to this line. This is finishing. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I want you to note this letter. And if I can, I want the camera to really zoom in on it. This is a Q in ancient Hebrew. The Q that was used in the Middle East would look uh, much like, if I may say, a small row standing alone. That's why that up until the year about 1850, it was thought, uh, well, this letter just simply wasn't understood. And then we find that not until, not until the Iberians or the Ten Tribes arrived in Spain and even further north was this letter used as Q. Therefore, identifying who accomplished the writing, the date approximately in as much as it was used from 500 B.C., and even by the year 100 B.C. Uh, less, it was even used in the Middle East. We find this in other writings among the Mound people down in Central America and other places in this great nation, or this hemisphere, rather, where this letter Q, in this matter, used in this manner, and no doubt, no doubt, being from the Ten Tribes. And then it continues on. As the camera just skims, I'm just going to translate the rest for you at random. Following the word Yahweh, that sacred name, in vain, remember the day, the Sabbath, and keep it holy this word holy, you pick back up the cue, honor thy, honor thy your father and your mother so that may be long your days on the land, which again, that sacred name, Yahweh, your one mighty is giving to you, not you shall murder, not ye shall commit adultery, not ye shall steal, not, and we go to the bottom, next to the bottom line, you shall testify against your neighbor a witness false not. You won't do that. Not you shall covet wife of your neighbors uh, or anything which too belongs uh, your neighbor. So again, the sacred name as it is found even in various manuscripts uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The sacred name mentioned in this beautiful manner. And this letter Q again. The letter Q. Used only by the ten tribes. And found in many places in the Americas. How precious it is. Dear one, you were there. With the Shepherd's Chapel. You were there to see the, the living proof that the ten tribes. You might say, well, could not someone fake this? My dear one. How could someone fake that letter Q that was used specifically by the Ten Tribes before the year 1830 when no one even knew what it meant? It was an unknown letter. This was placed here before the year 1830, certainly. No one could fake that. It is God's hand on his people as they migrate. Those people that he said, I will scatter, but in, in the end times, I will gather them. And I will gather them in my name. And in this great nation, America, where we go, even the money printed in God we trust. A leader of the free world. Not by accident, dear one. 
but by the hand of God. Yes, you were there, America, B.C. Another interesting thing that documents, he was no doubt the ten, one of the ten tribes that chiseled in this stone. Using, I have no doubt, the scribe and maul method. Using a dogish that was very unusual and was not understood, again, even as the Q. This particular letter giving the double M sign. And is it not strange that it says, Thy mother has honor thy father and thy mother. This letter, we'll speak more of it when we can illustrate it better on paper and give you more facts concerning it. Again, documenting this is not a forgery, but a work by a Hebrew scribe of the Iberians from the coast of Spain after the Caucasus mountains were crossed by our people and they settled through Spain moving into Europe. How precious that certain of that group traveling the Atlantic Ocean moving the, through the Gulf of Mexico up the Rio Grande River and then up this uh, jet into this very mountain recording this to document God is in control. All right, bless your hearts, it's time that we move on into this journey in America, B.C. We're standing at the gate entrance, that entrance to Hidden Valley, the Mystery Mountain. This gate entrance will take us to the top of this ridge. And on that ridge, Buzzy Roberts is going to show you the zodiac that actually dates one of the times that this great Mystery Mountain was not a great mystery to one army of men, small army, but men that worshipped Yahweh, even with his sacred name. America B.C., how beautiful it is. Behold the creation of thy maker. And as we make our way up to the top of this great hidden mountain, we pause and look back over the surrounding area, looking down to the back of the stone that has the Ten Commandments upon it. Just think, uh, before Christ's time, men walked this trail, our own people, searching, searching out God's creation, establishing their own rights and at, throughout this world, and this mountain, this great old volcano, would be one of those mountains they would travel to. You know, man can hardly travel anywhere without leaving sign. It is quite obvious they intended to leave sign. Paying respect and showing their love for our Heavenly Father. As we look out over this desert floor, halfway up uh, this particular mountain. Note some of the stones are perfectly round, meaning the volcano, uh, the lava of the volcano, this particular volcano, had a snowball effect. In other words, it rolled up and came down in balls. Some of them had being broken open, whereby you see even a convex uh, and uh, of, of the breakage. Now we're looking up to the ridge where, where we will find the zodiac. We see the shadow coming from the uh, left side of this uh, great pathway, this gate, being practically the only place you can see that any other spot would be very difficult. Here we have the helicopter giving you an aerial shot with the mountain just ahead. Many years ago, men traveled to this country here, doing it the easy way. We see the gateway, we see the stone, we see the passage, the trail to the top of this uh, great mountain, zooming in there on the zodiac as we travel around. Now, I want you to note that a, a company of men in that time, that time span from 500 to 107 BC, had an encampment on top of this great volcano. As Father's time goes from that volcano action, back in the world it was, even to the time that they, on this level plateau, more or less level, on this great black uh, 
lava top. Uh, we're able to have the view of the surrounding area and also with only one accessible trail were able to camp and protect themselves, building headquarters, having foxholes basically, never the type used by the American Indian, but by our people as they migrated throughout the country with those waterways that made great highways even in their time. As we circle, we see the high spot there where, where the other inscription will be, Yahweh, our Almighty, our Mighty One. How precious uh, God's creation. The eruption within this, I see back into time where we see those great fireballs rolling out of the inside of this when it was an active volcano. After having traveled the world two or three times, I have never seen volcanic uh, reactions such as this. Uh, as had you been standing at the gateway, there would be fire, hail, and brimstone coming from the top of this uh, down to the bottom. I wonder if our Father might have set this here, this hidden mountain, preserving it, locking it away, so that even in this generation, this final generation, this lost uh, generation, would be able to look back into that time to actually witness uh, our ancestors' migrations. I want you to remember from the book of Jeremiah, Father said, the dumb Stark even knows and remembers how to migrate from one place uh, back to the point of starting. My people don't. And how true it is uh, when we see the majesty and the presence uh, of our forefathers marking their, uh, our Heavenly Father's sacred name on this hidden mountain. I tell you this, it's an awe-inspiring uh, experience to tread this ground and feel the vibrations of times gone past to the eruption, to our Father's hailstones and these fireballs weighing no doubt up to a ton, some of them up to as much as a ton, some down to just smaller stones. Perfectly round, unusual. We'll have a shot of one sometime through this program. Mystery Mountain. What kind of mysteries does she have hidden? Well, I, we're going to analyze as, as we cover this mountain, and we will determine many of those. Number one, they were people that loved our Father. They knew His sacred name. They knew, as a matter of fact, that perfect name, YHVH, those consonants that were used throughout the world, starting from the Middle East, spreading out. How precious that they would end on this lava-topped mountain, hidden mountain, or as the Indians of the area would call it, the cliff with the strange writings. Our Father's mysteries unlocked for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear to know and to understand. I want you to notice from these shots we're looking at now from the helicopter how there is really only one way up on this mountain lest you were a mountain climber, making it almost a, a fortress, uh, making it almost like a mountain in the Middle East, looking very much even uh, the, uh, the shape, the size as that great mountain that our people once defended themselves in the Middle East. How precious our Father's creation. How precious that He formed all things. That He placed the wall by the sea and said, Water, pass no further. And with that same voice spoke and preserved this hidden mountain for the, for the inspection, for the hidden word, his word in ancient Hebrew, the same language and voice that he spoke to Moses in, Iya Asha Iya, I am that I am. Our Father's word, how precious he is and how good he is to lock that sacred name in, in the marvels of, yes, even this United States of America, America, B.C. We hope to make several uh, America BC's going to places in this country where Father has seen fit to lock in and hold and preserve that knowledge uh, for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. How precious it is that we're able to share this with you 
this hidden mountain, God's hidden mountain, a mountain con uh, containing those commandments that he said, simply do these, follow my voice. You will be my people, I will be your God. Oh, he loves you one. Let him know daily that you love him in return. Now we'll be going to Buzzy here soon. All right, we're looking here at the zodiac that's drawn up on the stone on Hidden Mountain in New Mexico that uh, Pastor Murray is found to be of quite import to the uh, Israelite faith. And this zodiac that we see drawn on the ground has been dated to the year of 106 B.C., September 18th. Uh, this zodiac is a picture of an eclipse that occurred at that time, and uh, it has been documented through by Bill McClone of the Western Epigraphic Society as being uh, an authentic eclipse that literally occurred with the constellations in this position. What we have here is in the center, as I point out with this stick, we see a rounded area that is the center, which is a symbol of the Earth or the viewer at the time of this eclipse. It is also in this center that you see a tail coming back around, which is a symbol of Draco the dragon. Uh, at the six, around 6,000 BC, uh, the pole star that uh, our heavens circulated around was in Draco the dragon called Thuban, the star. Today it's in uh, the small uh, bear, what we call the small bear, or Ursa Minor, and it's pole st uh, Polaris, the pole star, which if we look up above right here, this is a symbol at that time of the small dipper, and this is a symbol of the big dipper. Uh, we see here in this area a sign of a moon with a crescent and an arrow shaped here. It's in this sign, which is called the Lost Lunar Sign, or the lunar sign, that the eclipse actually occurred. It occurred around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the eclipse occurred in this lunar uh, solar area. And within the line here, we had Mercury, we had Jupiter, and we had Mars, who came and conjuncted each other with, at that time. All right, this eclipse, according to the, um, the book that we use, uh, says that it occurred in the constellation of Le uh, Virgo. Well, we all know that Virgo is a symbol of, uh, used on the pyramids, the Great Pyramid of Giza with the Sphinx, showing us where the zodiac begins and ends. We also know that Virgo is also a sign of the virgin birth, the beginning of the cycle of Christ and the earth and showing us how that he was to be born to a virgin and come into the earth afterwards to be uh, killed and to become our sacrifice, become the savior of mankind. But we have here uh, the constellation that stands for Scorpio. All right, we see the scorpion's tentacles uh, reaching out here. And with this, this uh, eclipse occurring between Virgo, which is this big constellation here, and Scorpio, we see that that eclipse literally occurred in between those two uh, signs. See, Libra is, is the sign next to uh, Virgo. And it is a corruption because today we have Libra as a set of scales. And the scales were not used in the ancient times as uh, a sign of the zodiac, but it was a sign of an altar. And today, if you look at, uh, at a uh, picture of the uh, zodiac, a lot of the stars that were incorporated in to the sign of Libra are no longer with Libra, but they are a part of another constellation, which is Scorpio. So what has happened is Scorpio, which is a symbol of the demonic people, or Satan's seed line, so to speak, let's just say, has gone in and has incorporated some of this altar that comes through Libra into its constellation. So we have lost some of Libra or the altar to Scorpio. And thus we see that there is a conflict today in the world through the satanic seed line and God's holy seed line. By them taking away from the altar or taking away from the cross of Christ or taking away from the sacrifices of the Father, 
through Jesus Christ, and they have incorporated into the scales, which is a, a sign of humanism. It's a sign of, of, of a balance of scales, but it's used for judgment. But today, the judgment of man was instituted by the Father in the beginning through the altar and not by a scale. Again, as we go in, we see Scorpio. We see here Sagittarius in this area. We go on up into this area and we see the constellation of boats, B-O-O-T-E-S. Uh, we can go on around. Over here we see Hercules. We go on up into this region and we see the constellation of Lyra, the harp. And on over here we see the constellation of uh, Cygnus, which is also the cross, the northern cross. And on up above, r right in this area, we see the constellation of Cassiopeia. What we have here is we have a pretty good picture of God's plan showing us in the last days, I believe, what is going to be going on in this earth. We see uh, this mountain being called Hidden Mountain, where God has hid us and kept us safe, has kept this stone safe. He's got a people that are uh, that are kept in his fold. And he's showing us that there's going to be a corruption in the last days through uh, the altar, that the altar is going to be removed, the blood sacrifice of Christ of the cross, and we're going to see humanism set into place. And we're going to see that through that humanism, we're going to see the Redeemer's conflict brought to naught. So in essence, we're going to see the Christian's uh, ability to stand against the evils of this world brought down. Okay, we see from that time on, we see Sagittarius, which is a symbol of the Redeemer's triumph. We see him, we know that Sagittarius is an archer who is shooting an arrow into the scorpion, into the heart of, of the scorpion, which is the star Antares. And what he's doing is he's destroying the work of Satan. And we see that that Redeemer, his triumph, will come through the arrow or through the, 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 the word of God going straight to the mark. All right, we see the sign of boats. Again, I want to go into it. Boats is a sign of the coming one. Uh, the brightest star in boats is Arcturus, which means that he cometh. And see, all these are things that were hoped for in those days because this actually was done before Christ was ever born onto this earth in flesh. As we go on up, we see Hercules in this area being uh, the name Hercules or the constellation meaning the mighty vanquisher. So we see the story of Christ written here in a lot of ways, in, in different ways that he is going to come into this world and he's going to redeem us. He's going to come in. He's going to use his cross, his blood, to be the redemption and our triumph. He's going to use uh, boats as being uh, the coming one to show us that he is coming. Here's the world again in the middle that's in the seas of, of Satan, of Draco the dragon. And that he, the whole, everything evolves around that, the, the conflict being there. We see through Lyra the harp, that is the original pole star of uh, our universe. And it takes 26,000 years plus for our whole uh, universe uh, to go around one circuit, just like our Earth goes around the sun uh, in a year. So what we've got here is we see that we're going to return to Lyra the harp or to the worship when it's all said and done. We're going to see Cygnus the cross as being our symbol of survival in this day. We're going to see Cassiopeia up there, who is the captive. She's a symbol of, she's in chains, she's in bondage, and she's the symbol of the bride who is in bondage, and it means that the captive is to be delivered. The captive is preparing for her husband for the return of her king, which is the church today, which is the believer. So what we have here in just these few signs of the constellation, uh, I believe, is a, is a, is a hope, is a is an opportunity for us to reach in and to look into the zodiac and say is God writing a message to the church today is he telling us to look into this area where our people have have tread up on this hillside and see uh, has he left us a message was there uh, a royal priesthood that stood on this on this mountain here in New Mexico come up the Rio Grande River have they experienced this zodiac and is he showing us through this zodiac which occurred 
this this uh, eclipse occurred approximately three and a half years before the Jubilee year. So we see that there's a good possibility that the Father's showing us maybe uh, within a time span of a three and a half year period after we see that the altar of Christ is pulled down, we see humanism set into place, we see Satan ruling, and we're going to see the full completed work of Christ come about. That there is a hope for the for the, uh, the enslaved one, the bride, the ones that are in bondage to Lucifer this day. Uh, thank you, Buzzy Roberts, for that report. Our Father created all the stars in the heaven. And when you know and understand his scripture, you understand that Bible that is written in the stars. And here he left with the knowledge and the wisdom, even before Christ walked the earth, that these pilgrims that set foot on this mountain were able to record this eclipse, whereby in this century, this 20th century, in this last generation, we would be able to document the very year and time that this particular this uh, zodiac was placed upon this stone, speaking a language that all Christians understand, if indeed they be scholars of our Father's Word. Again, thank you, Buzzy, for that report, locking in that date with uh, the surety that our people, our ancestors, were on this mountain at 107 B.C., that is to say, before Christ. Thanks again, Buzz. It is the custom of our people to always build the altar at the high spot in the surrounding territory where we worship. And here you have that sacred name on this altar. Look at that sacred name well. YHVH, the top letter reading from the right to the left, and then the word below it being E-L-H-Y-N-W. Yahweh is our mighty one. This altar that these ones who so loved God, respected, and no doubt thanked Him for this safe journey. There you have a good view of the waterway in which they followed in. Building this altar to Him, Yahweh, is our mighty one. This altar on the high point at the top of this wonderful mountain. How precious it is as we scan and we see that it is the high place. Uh, as they were able to live in peace and comfort uh, at the top of this, uh, knowing they were well protected. Coming in from the back then of the stone, you'll be looking at the writing upside down. The sacred name at the bottom now, because we've circled from the back. Our Father, let Him know that you love Him. He certainly loves you when you worship Him. Let's investigate the top of this mountain as we are here. Here you see an outpost built out away from the headquarters building, built not like a, the Indians would build a, an out hole, out, uh, out camp, but here we see a fortified, much like our people would still build a foxhole. You can see the outlines of another one there in the center of the mountain. We see the view from the top of this mountain from this foxhole, we will call it, out how perfect. And here you see the main foundation of uh, the main house uh, as it was a line there with a view over the area. How precious our Father. You know, man always leaves tracks when he stays a period of time on this earth. Uh, does a man pollute? Well, I will leave that up to you. But he does leave sign that he has been here. And we see the walls, the outline. And as we swing back here, we see another foxhole or a fortification that was set near the edge for protection. And how precious it, would, it is that we know and can identify by the method of uh, fortification and the buildings themselves that our people were here. Yes, in America, B.C. We were there with them. And here let's analyze just some of the signs man does leave. Uh, there were some signs that it's difficult to understand. Was this a character from the Zodiac? Well, it's a possibility. But when man does uh, 
inhabit a place, what does he do in his spare time as he gazes out? Yet the signs, were they cartoons? Well, I rather doubt that. I'm sure that particular one was a direction figured by the, by the sun, a direction, perhaps the surrounding area by this, uh, used even by the Spanish in counting mountaintops, uh, even down to the 18th century, 18th, 19th. Uh, but we see the signs left by these people as they spent this time atop this mystery mountain. Signs uh, done at leisure? Well, again, we leave that up to you. Perhaps they will mean more to you than they would someone else. But how beautiful, the mysteries hidden, but always, even with the altar at the high point on this mountain, the altar with that sacred name, Yahweh, the Tetragrammation, the love and the respect showing our Father. Whatever sign they left, the fact that he took the highest seat, or they offered and kneeled to the highest seat on this mountain, documents, in fact, that they are a people, yes, our ancestors, that were here in America, in America, B.C. How precious our Father's time, as time means nothing to him, certainly to us, it documents his history, his word, his perfect written word. Well, we come to the end of a long day. A day of searching, amazement, wonder, and marvel. <laughs> One little marvel such as we see in this black stone where it has rolled over granite or another surface, and we see that the black under each letter is barely below the surface. And note here you have a square block of the black, and what a beautiful sight, the sacred name. Our Father's name, Y-H-V-H, in that beautiful language. How precious. Well, it's been a rewarding day, and we hope that you've enjoyed this as much as we've enjoyed researching it and bringing it to you. How could this stone stay preserved this many years? Because truly, you can walk in, uh, in circles, as we have done, and see writings by other people very recent, initials of people leaving their mark but our Heavenly Father intended that this gateway be left open and it is called the gateway to the Mystery Mountain and so it has been left open for some reason whether it be the American Indians before the 1800s or recent uh, um, young people, old people prospectors protected. And what a beautiful stone it is. And as much as were you to look just above this, you will notice that this very large piece of lava is flaking, it is shattered. But this part of the stone is as solid as the rock of Gibraltar, and I can lay my arm with one foot, solid mass, protected, hidden. Our Father has a way of doing that. So, we bring to a close, then, this particular gateway and a close to the hidden mystery, all right, our Father. But there's no mystery to it, really. When we see the ten tribes as they walked this earth, this land, America, America, B.C., you bet. And, you know, when we get to that time and that age to come, we're going to understand more, not only about America, B.C., we're going to learn more about America and the world it was, as we've already done through the dinosaur tracks. But praise God, we're going to learn more about that America of the future when our Father, His Savior, Yeshua Messiah, return and join us. Uh, God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation.